I am Ivana Damjanovic and with my colleague Nicola de Sadeler we will delve into the links between trade and sustainable development and provide different perspectives on the European Union's trade and sustainability agenda. It's our pleasure today to interview Philippe Lorbrecht, Professor at UCL Luva and Honorary Secretary General of the Belgian Federation of Enterprise. Good morning. Sustainable development is a concept that has different meanings. From your perspective, how would you define it? Well, sustainable development is a way to keep on developing, but in a sustainable way. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's really a question of creating long-term value by diminishing the negative impact of the development of the activities of the human activities on Earth. And those are eventually concerned with environment, with human rights and governance. When we talk about Europe and its global power, would you say that it is the strength of the EU's internal market or rather the EU's trade agreements that have contributed to that global position of Europe? Well, I, I think that both contribute in fact because Europe is not an island all by itself. You know, we are in a global world. We have seen the globalization during the last 30 years, I would say. And so we can't just forget that the rest of the world is not necessarily looking at Europe. But Europe has this incredible power to have a united market for 27 nations and more than 450 million consumers. These consumers have an importance uh, for the counterparts outside of Europe. So if we do uh, put stricter rules about sustainable development for our market, we will have an impact not only in Europe but also abroad. And this is also important in the way we, uh, we, we draft our investment uh, treaties and we uh, organize our commercial relationship with the other parts of the world. In 2021, the European Commission adopted the communication uh, Green Deal for Europe that has been followed by the communication 5455. Mm -hmm. um, and these communications are leading to uh, the adoption of a flurry of legislation uh, regarding uh, renewable energy, ecosystem resilience, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is this a new momentum for the European businesses? It is definitely, I would say, a change in the business perspective because business has been aware of problems of environment, has been aware of the problems of a long value chain, but the problem is there was no real international framework in order to standardize the way everyone would do the job. Now, the problem eventually for European business will be to uh, get to those high standards why some of their competitors outside of Europe do not follow the same one. But on the other side, you could believe that eventually the famous Brussels effect could benefit to this development of sustainable uh, development. So it's really a gamble on the capacity of Europe to convince the other players worldwide that they should also pay a lot of attention to sustainable development. Uh, as we are aware, a number of EU internal market legislation have an extraterritorial uh, impact, Definitely. such as uh, the REACH regulations on chemical, RGDP on data protection. I in addition, uh, in accordance with the Green Deal, uh, the forthcoming legislation on due diligence, uh, deforestation, CBAM uh, are likely to uh, impact uh, our trade relations uh, with uh, third countries. Um, many critics uh, abroad um, uh, estimate that these legislations are lurking a protectionist stance on behalf of the EU. What, what, what you comment? Well, you know, you can see it from different perspectives. From the European perspective, I think we really want to make more sustainable development possible. We don't have too much time to do it. The time is running and we have to act. 
We do believe that by having better ESG standards, by making sure that we look at uh, with vigilance to our supply chain, we can improve things. Now, you can look at it like, well, this is a problem because you are going to be more protectionist. But is it protectionism to ask that the competitors that come in Europe do follow the same rules as the uh, companies in Europe. We don't ask them to do more than all companies do. We just ask them to do the same. Addressing CBAM, is that not a risk of price differentiation between the certificates on importing steel and the carbon CO2 market prices? There are always uh, technical problems that you can see in all these international trades but you know I'm looking at it from the global perspective I'm looking at it from what do we want as a community of more than 450 million inhabitants and what we want is to decarbonate as much as possible and we want to do our share in Europe but we want the others to do their shares too so if they don't decarbonate then there will be a, 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 an, an impact for that. And do you believe that these measures are actually going to have influence in third states? <laughs> well, it's, it's the gamble. As I said earlier, uh, we are strong defenders of trying to prevent uh, the catastrophe that we are looking at. You know, we speak now of to more than 1.5 degrees of increase in the temperature. We see that there are problems with biodiversity. We see that there is more and more scarcity in the raw materials. So we have to act. We do it the European way, meaning we use legal text, uh, we use treaties, we, we use the legal toolbox to reach that. And of course, there is a lot of discussion, even within Europe, where, for instance, not everyone in the business community is looking to this with enthusiasm. But I would say many people, and I've met a lot of them, do realize the urgency. And that is also true when you look at all the business conduct rules that have been adopted in the last 20 years regarding ESG and all these elements. And is there a fear that there will be that the, all these measures will increase the regulatory burden on European companies and hence hinder its global competitiveness? It, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. The answer is yes. And I think that to a certain extent this fear has many rights to be there. I will just give you one example, the GDPR. When you realize that we European companies have today to decide by ourselves whether or not a country outside Europe is GDPR compliant without having the possibility to rely on European instances to tell us if they are or not, then you ask yourself, yeah, in what game are we playing? But if I go a little bit further, uh, I would really uh, try to plead for Europe to be a little bit more pragmatical in its approach. I think that there could be a lot more discussion with business, but also with the global society in how do we make all this possible. And I know that there is a lot of consultancy in Europe, but I don't think they really reach the level of consultancy I'm asking or of the consultation I'm talking about. We, 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 we just need to ask ourselves, how do you, as a large company, make your due diligence possible on 200,000 suppliers, for instance. How do you do that? Those are questions that business is confronted with. But the, the same questions are there also for the states. How do they make themselves compliant with the same questions? You know, it's not only for business. It's for us all as citizens, but it's also for the states. It's also for the local municipalities.
as a matter of emergency, uh, the EU is uh, striving for full decarbonization to get rid of CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions in order yes. to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, in that connection, uh, there is a key uh, legislation, the regulation on taxonomy, enticing uh, investment that are deemed to be sustainable. Uh, recently, the European Commission has been carving out a specific regime uh, for gas and nuclear plants uh, in the frame of this transition toward the decarbonization. What are your views about uh, uh -huh. this development? Well, my, my views, if I've looked at what we need in the energy system globally in order to be zero emission in 2050, we need a mix of energy products. If we want to do it without gas and without nuclear power as a carve-out period, then we can't do it. I mean, all the technical studies that have been made show that the energy mix that you need in order to reach that goal will not be enough without gas for a certain period and without nuclear energy. Uh, it's, it's just a question of how do you produce your energy and, uh, well, nuclear energy has no negative emission or nearly none, while many of the other elements of the energy mix still have an impact. social responsibility is a very important part uh -huh. of sustainable agenda of the True. EU. Could you tell us what are some of the obligations that EU companies have in this regard? Definitely. Well, we, we should make a difference between public interest companies and large companies mm -hmm. and the smaller, uh, small and medium sized enterprises. But when you look at what is going to be seen in the proposal for the uh, CS3D, the, the, the due diligence directive we call it, then we think that about 55,000 large companies will be directly responsible for having this due diligence on their whole value chain. But if you tell with that all the people in the value chain, in Europe, there will be many more than 55,000 companies impacted by that. That's one point. The second point is we shouldn't forget that um, sustainable finance is already there and putting a lot of pressure on the banks, but also on all the investment products and invest asset managers to only uh, produce or give credit in a sustainable way. And the way to do that is by relating to the taxonomy, which is supposed to tell us what are the activities that are from an economical perspective responsible. Uh, corporate sustainability uh, is meaning do try to change the way you do business in a more sustainable way. The taxonomy is telling us and that is the big question because the taxonomy has just been approved and it's still used to make the standards that companies will need to apply. So we are progressing at the same time as we are drafting nearly, I would say.
your view the, the fact that major uh, European corporations are, are ready to play the game, are ready to embark upon the energy transition, the circular economy, is it going to give an edge to the European industries? Well, I, I do hope so. Truly, I hope so because uh, I think it's fundamental for the future of our lives, of our planet. Uh, business has to take into consideration the new reality and the new reality is a reality of more scarcity than in the past. Uh, the new reality is that we have to pay attention because the climate is increasing. We need to pay attention because we are polluting way too much and business is really uh, realizing this. If business is looking at it from a corporate sustainable way, it can't do otherwise. The, the, the willingness of the European institution under the auspices of the Green Deal to reconcile a business perspective with sustainability, is it a new down for Europe? It is a new down for Europe, but not for business. In my view, business has been concerned with sustainability for a long time. Think, for instance, that we are since 1990 already in situation where we have to take down our emissions. Uh, business has always been keen also, certainly in Europe, with protection of the employees, of the workers on this side. We have probably in Europe uh, some of the most advanced protection of workers' laws. We have environmental laws that are extremely important. So I would say that Europe has a very interesting level of uh, legislation on ESG. But the question is, we have been also disindustrializing. We have been, to some way, externalizing our industry in other parts of the world. And there, there are still problems. There are still a lot of uh, questions regarding ESG. So we hope that in the one way by having more impact in what we do in Europe, but also what we do thanks to our suppliers outside Europe, we will have a global impact. But we are not the only ones playing. There are other large economies worldwide, and we hope that they will be interested in the way Europe is progressing. And I, if I'm well aware of, uh, it rings bells in other parts of the world. And truly, when, when you look, for instance, at the ambition of China to be CO2 emission-free by 2060. When you look at the gap of time, we have been in the emission of gas and China has been in the emission of gas. I find it a relatively good horizon for them. So I hope the other parts of the world will do likewise. And just a question that is kind of extension to your comment. Do you think that these measures are going to lead to changes in trade flows? Oh, they might. Uh, the, the question is, once again, the ability of business to sustain its engagements and its obligations. Now, we are living in a society where uh, international activities can be looked at from the home uh, country of a company and it can have a very negative impact on the image of the company even if it happens 10,000 kilometers away from where your headquarters are uh, registered or situated and, and therefore I think that the consumers, the public do want business to walk the way. The fair question to add and from the business perspective is probably are consumers ready to walk the same way? Are consumers ready to go to these new business models that will be necessary in order to make the transition possible? Will they adapt themselves? It's not only a question of offer, it's also a question of demand. Thank you very much indeed Philippe Lorbrec for providing your insight on the Nexus of trade and sustainability. My pleasure.